Hey, Geraldine. Hey, Jason. How are you? Yeah, coping coping well actually um, better than uh what I I expected because uh honestly when I first heard that the whole circuit breaker was going to be extended to June, it was um a little bit disappointing. But I also understand the rationale behind it. So I've been still sticking to my schedule pretty often, like uh working out quite frequently, and you know just um making sure I keep myself occupied, especially on weekends when there's no work and everything. How about yeah. yourself? Yeah. No, I, I think uh, <laughs> before we uh, start talking about um, how the circuit breaker is affecting us, uh, thanks uh, everyone for joining us on uh, Andawa's Life. Uh, Today, uh, our webinar is going to be focused on uh, human capital uh, over COVID-19, right? So I, I think um, a lot of uh, our past webinars have been really heavily uh you know, on finance and uh, investing content. I think this is one of those where we really want to talk about uh, other things that affect you. I think in Ray Ming's and uh, Xing Xi's webinar, uh, you know, we were talking about human capital and how that is, you know, that beacon that can help you move forward. Uh, this would be that seminar, that webinar for it. And then I think we'll talk more about how to grow your human capital. And so I, I guess right now it's, it's before, um, we're still a little early. We just wait for people to stream in. And uh, I think uh, Geraldine was just sharing how uh, the uh, extended circuit breaker has affected her life. I think personally, uh, interestingly, this is like my longest hair. As in, I've grown it to the longest, like since um, college. So at least 10 years since I had, I've had this length of hair. So. You never thought of visiting your hairstylist as one of the most important things, but you know, of course, amongst other inconveniences, you know, being able to exercise, uh, being able to go to the market and supermarket for groceries is actually something that I'm very thankful for. So, so how how has like like besides uh, like how has working from home been like? Do you have what you need to, you know, be effective at home? Uh, it took some time to actually set up my um, proper desk and everything. But other than that, like, I guess that, you know, I'm fine um, coping with, 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 with this. Uh, yeah. Okay. So I, I think it's, uh, okay, 7.02. Uh, yeah, I think we can just uh, proceed with the webinar. So I think for starters, uh, we are going to do an introduction. Uh, Geraldine, what about uh, you sharing about uh, yourself first? Okay, so hi everyone. Thanks for joining us today and attending this webinar. My name is Geraldine and I am a blogger. So I actually care a lot about the issues that impact our generation. So topics that I cover would include things like how we can all cope with the high cost of living, uh, stay relevant in our digital economy, build rewarding careers, and also uh, lead meaningful lives. So that is what I do uh, for, for my blog. And of course, I also have a day job. And in my day job, I'm actually working at a US tech company. Oh, okay. I mean, thanks for the introduction. I've read some of uh, Geraldine's articles, and uh, one of them was uh, pretty uh, interesting. So she talks about how, uh, like, when is the fastest or rather like at which part of a career is when you can grow your salary the fastest. So I think that was one of her more popular articles as well. So um, a bit more about myself. Uh, I've joined uh, Endowas recently and uh, I've spent uh, around three and a half years across uh, Singapore and Philippines uh, as the CMO for Lazada. I've had around, I think more than 10, year, 10 years of experience across various industries, uh, financial services, education, recruitment, uh, even trip fair and conferences. Um, yeah, so, so that's me in a nutshell. Uh, further down uh, the slides, I will share a bit more about my career journey as well. No, sorry, sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> so okay. Just to reiterate what uh, Jason pointed out earlier on today at the uh, beginning, for those of you who have just joined, today we are not really going to be covering uh, about investments. So if you actually attended the previous uh, webinar with the Works at uh, one of the panelists, Zheng Shi, actually brought up that there's two kinds of capital that you have, right? One of them is the financial capital, which Endows has actually covered extensively in their previous sessions. 
And for, for today, we're going to focus on the second kind of capital you have, which is your human capital. So things like your employability, your career and all that. We're going to be discussing mainly on this. So we will start the session with first explaining a little bit more about how the COVID-19 uh, has actually impacted our lives. Then we will move on to other components, for example, like how you can actually, um, you know, uh, use personal branding to differentiate yourself as well as to stand out in the competitive job market, uh, how you can upgrade yourself and also protect your cash flow. So after every section, right, what we'll be doing is actually addressing the questions uh, one by one that you guys have. So if you have any questions, please feel free to leave them in the YouTube uh, comments so that we can actually address them like after each section. Yeah. Yeah, so, and sorry, just to interrupt. Uh, before we start, uh, we, um, these sessions are very helpful for us, you know, to convey the messages, you know, with regards to and now us being a robo advisor about uh, different tips um, to, you know, human capital, your financial future, retirement, etc. So uh, please do like our YouTube page and uh, follow us across our uh, social media channels as well. Yeah, so I had to do a plug there. Thanks, Geraldine. You can go <laughs> ahead with your slides. No problem. So, okay, let's just start off with first, uh, how has the COVID-19 actually impacted our lives, right? So, a lot has actually happened over the past few weeks. And what I did was actually, I went to kind of like do a survey on, on Facebook, like an informal poll, just to find out like what was happening on the ground and how are actually people feeling about the current state. And what I found, right, is that, you know, overwhelmingly, you can see that, you know, job security is a very, very key concern for many of us here in Singapore. And this entire fear that people are experiencing, right, it isn't something just based on like, oh, gut feeling or like hearsay. If, if I look at the estimated numbers that the banks and all these research agencies have been publishing, I too would feel quite kind of worried, right? So if you look at the numbers, okay, um, they're actually quite devastating. Like it's estimated that, you know, 150,000 um, people are going to be retrenched this, uh, during this period. And this was an estimate by Maybank that was published, I think, sometime earlier this month. And if you compare that to previous recessions, actually, it's pretty um, significant. So if you look at the 2008 to 2009 global financial crisis, it's only about 40,000 retrenchments. Not only that, but that was a pretty, pretty significant number. And if you look at this, it's like much, much more than that. And on top of that, besides retrenchment, firms are also cautious about hiring. There was this uh, Mercer survey uh, that was conducted in early March that um, you know, they actually shared that one in five companies intend to freeze their hiring. And this, is, this was statistics from early March and way before the circuit breaker began. So I'm not so sure, like even after two circuit breakers, whether or not it will still be one in five or whether there will be an increase. But I do hope that you know, the hmm. number either stays the same or decline. So times are are really not just difficult, right, for people who are working like you and me. Uh, it also impacts, you know, our fresh graduates. In normal circumstances, it is really quite challenging to transit from, you know, university life to this whole working world. And this crisis actually makes it a lot harder for, for them. Yeah, but this is just my view. Maybe, Jason, you can also share a little bit more about, like, what is your take on this current situation? No, so, so I mean, you are entirely right, right? I, I mean, the facts speak for itself. Uh, looking at the, the numbers, I mean, I, we, we don't want to talk about the gloom and, doom and gloom that's happening over COVID. We know that's happening. And we have seen what's, uh, how it's affected businesses in Singapore. And, you know, Singapore is the country in Southeast Asia for the most number of firsts, the, the best airport in the world, you know, the, the best airline in the world, you know, the first this and that. And now we are the first in Asia for... Uh, Southeast Asia, at least for infections, right? So <laughs> that's not a good title to claim. But also, obviously, we are the first uh, amongst uh, testing. So, I mean, those numbers, you know, maybe there, it, it looks um, seemingly high. Uh, but obviously, it's, it's, it's our government doing a good job in uh, trying to ensure that, you know, we weed out the, the, the virus, you know, across the entire population, right? So... Yeah, you know, amidst the doom and gloom, uh, it's interesting to see how uh, businesses have also changed, you know, and, and, you know, changed their strategies around tackling uh, the business, uh, the consumers today. Uh, you see there's an increase in people looking for um, how to make bread. So, you know, for a moment of time, in a moment of time, there was like people looking for like yeast in supermarkets. And I believe some of the supermarkets are still... <laughs> 
uh, finding it hard. But I think globally, you, know, you look at businesses that have suddenly thrived, you know, Zoom, uh, and a lot of these gaming uh, apps, you know, the, the, the downloads that have uh, seen like 3x growth, like 100x growth, you know, it's, it's crazy. And I think locally, uh, the, the ones that are really getting a lot of traction from uh, people that are affected by COVID, especially for the circuit breaker period, are those that uh, can deliver. So the likes of your e-commerce brands, uh, Kuten, Shopee, and uh, you know, delivery services. Uh, I mean, we, we're used, where McDonald used to trump has now unfortunately uh, no longer there, right? You have KFC and of course, Ninja Van being a logistics provider. So, so how, you know, how are you as an individual, you know, trying to um, change, you know, the way this whole economy is shifting? You know, a lot of businesses are pressured to becoming more digital, but you know, digital is a it's such a broad word, right? So everyone is talking about going digital, but as an individual, you know, do you think you have the skill sets to uh, press on in this um, unfortunate uh, black swan event? Okay, yeah, I think you're on mute. <laughs> okay. uh, sorry. No yeah, worries. so basically, um, Jason, I think that, you know, what you pointed out was very true. Um, just like how some companies are actually, uh, you know, getting hit during this time, right, by innovating, having a strong value proposition, you know, as individuals, we can also do the same uh, in order to stand out in the job market, which brings us to our next point, right, about how you can actually... Uh, you know, use this time, use this period, you know, when you're looking for jobs, if you're looking for jobs to kind of like get ahead of the competition. So there's many, many ways that you can use to kind of like stand out in the job market. And LinkedIn is one of the resources that you can use. Now, LinkedIn is not this place, right, where you just like upload your resume online and then you totally forget about, about it and never log in again, okay? Um, the platform has also evolved over time and you can actually use this platform for quite a few ways. You can engage your network to ask for referrals. Uh, you can also research about hiring managers or reach out to them. And I think what is also valuable for us is that you can also use this as a platform to kind of engage the recruiters that you know you who are actually hiring for roles that you are interested in. Now, many recruiters actually use LinkedIn to find candidates these days. And I'm going to be focusing on two aspects, right? First of all, how can you help recruiters to find you? And also how you can actually reach out to recruiters. So it's two ways, right? Inbound and outbound. Now, let's start with the first point, right? On how you can actually help recruiters to find you. And uh, for myself, I've been actually work, taking steps to optimize my LinkedIn, uh, you know, not just during this period, but over time. And even during the COVID-19 period, I still get at least one or two recruiters messages per week because I've actually made my profile something that is actually suitable for search. Now, when I think about how I actually optimize my LinkedIn profile, right, I put myself in the recruiter's shoes first and try to think about the process in which they look for a candidate. So the first tip I have would be that, you know, when you add your company name, right, use the official page. Don't type in like manually and like create like a new company, you know, instead use the autofill uh, option. And let me explain why this is important for you guys, right? Because often the hiring managers will actually give recruiters like this list of companies that they want the recruiters to look for, you know, to fill the position. And when the recruiter is using the advanced search function on LinkedIn, they actually filter down to see like what is actually, who has actually worked at a certain company or is currently working there. And you will not show up on the filter, right, if you do not use your official company page. So as much as possible, try to use the official company page that you have so you can enable yourself to be easily found on LinkedIn. That is the first tip that I have. And say you don't work in a brand name company, right? Uh, that you know recruiters tend to look for, but not 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 all hope is lost because you can still optimize your headline, correct? So um, the professional headline has quite a lot of weight in the internal LinkedIn search algorithm. So the right keywords in your headline will actually make you visible, you know, more visible on the LinkedIn search. And and be sure to actually take these keywords, right, and kind of repeat them throughout your profile, like in the description about yourself and also your job description. Okay, speaking of job description, uh, another point to note, right, when you're talking about job description is to actually not focus on the tasks you do at the, uh, in your workplace, but actually focus on your achievements. So instead of like, oh, I ran advertisements on Facebook and Instagram and Google for my company, talk about like, 
you know, not the task, but the outcome, right? Talk about the ROI you achieved, like how many leads you generated, how many deals you help, have helped to influence, to close for your company and all that. So just point out those kind of tangible uh, ROI and try to quantify it. Like. So ultimately just do your best to tie whatever you have done back to the uh, revenue and also the profitability of your company. That would actually help you to kind of stand out in the market. Okay, so what I've done so far is actually I've actually summarized for you how you can actually optimize your profile for job search. Now I'm going to talk about how you can actually reach out to recruiters proactively because it's a two-way thing, right? You don't have to wait for recruiters to find you. You can also look for them proactively. So for myself, let me just share my personal story, right? Since I was like 25 or 24 years old, I've always wanted to join Salesforce and I already set my sights on this company. I will end up here one day and this is the specific position I want and I was actually building up myself slowly for for this role, okay? Why? Because um, Salesforce is actually the, one of the top players in SaaS. Uh, they're very high growth. They're one of the best comp structure. So I knew that if I were to get the role, right, it would actually be something that is very positive for, for my career. And I think throughout 2008, 2018, yeah, I tried around four times to, to get into the company. And even with referral, right, I feel I didn't even get like an interview. So when, you know, the time came that I felt like, okay, this is not working. So when I saw a position, right, I actually went to another route. So what I did wasn't just like rely on referral and, um, you know, job portal only. I went to approach the recruiter directly, right, and write into him like, hey, I saw that you are actually hiring for this role. I'm interested for it. You know, are you available for a call? Because I'd like to share with you like what, how I can contribute to, to that. And because of this move, I managed to get an interview from, from there. Now, what I've just shared is just my personal experience as someone who was actually looking for a job and really, really wanted to enter a competitive company. Jason, as a CMO, you also probably use LinkedIn quite a bit. So what other tips do you have for our audiences who are trying to stand out on LinkedIn, you know, and also outside of LinkedIn? Okay, uh, just to get the new people that just joined us uh, on board with what we have been sharing so far, we are, we are just... Uh, now talking about you know how to um, get a head start on your um, what's it um, the competition yes so we looked at LinkedIn as the lowest hanging fruit to uh, really boost your career and I think Geraldine has shared a, a lot of her personal tips with regards to um, you know framing that perfect profile for your recruiter or even uh, the dream brand that you are talking to but I think for me it really boils down to a few basics that uh, you know as an individual you know being on LinkedIn and being a professional and how you want to, you know, have people uh, engage with you and how you engage with the brands and recruiters and so on and so forth. So, so for me, right, uh, I think for starters, being authentic is, is one of the uh, key areas uh, of um, focus, right? Uh, I feel like a lot of people tend to go a little off tangent, you know, I think unfortunately or, or fortunately they are speaking for topics that are outside of their area of expertise, right? And, and you know, I think it's, it's really so much easier to talk about the things that you are an expert in, or, you know, you are trying to anchor with regards to a particular industry that you are going in and have done research about. So, so talking passionately and then having it flow out naturally is really something that I've seen uh, work really well with um, certain profiles that I follow on LinkedIn. So the next part is uh, being really specific about uh, your engagement on um, your LinkedIn profile, right? Talking about topics, talking about, you know, uh, news articles, uh, commenting on other people's posts. I think a lot of times uh, people just give very sweeping statements, you know, like uh, your data is not grounded or, you know, like then they quote off um, another article or a, a paper and they, they often leave a gap in terms of um, uh, 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 an inkling to what this person is trying to say, right? So, so you should be constructive with whatever comments that you are posting, whatever, you know, posts that you are, you know, trying to put out and, and have a voice in all those. So for instance, I, I, I think, I, I mean, I'm not saying that this is the best example because it's my post, but uh, I think with regards to how, you know, the FMB scene was affected by the whole COVID situation and how uh, there was an attack on Grab and how Grab responded very quickly with an image, you know. So, so for me, it was really uh, dissecting what went wrong there. But at the end of uh, my post, uh, my stand was that actually, you know what, um, you depend on the merchants as much as they depend on you. 
uh, at the end of this um, journey, uh, you really have to show that you are sticking it in like thick and thin. And you know, the next step for you to do, I mean, of course, uh, barring profitability is to you know, try and lower your commissions. Uh, so that's just one example, right? Uh, try not to repost and try not to quote people's uh, articles because that is so pointless. Uh, a lot of people can just go in and read those articles unless you have something to say that's constructive, really just uh, not post anything. That's my <laughs> advice. And the last part is very straightforward, right? It's not just for LinkedIn. I think it's uh, across all social media channels. We have so many keyboard warriors in Singapore, everywhere. And, and a lot of people are quick to jump on uh, criticisms and you know how things can be done better. Uh, I think it's fine when it's constructive, but I think uh, you know it needs to come off as uh, genuine and it needs to come off as uh, non-abrasive, right? So, so the main thing that you should try and hope from uh, criticism or something that is a constructive comment, it's for change. And I think we should all uh, strive towards being that person on LinkedIn. Because you know what, at the end of the day, these people are the ones, uh, you know, your recruiters, your coworkers in the future, your current um, colleagues, they'll come to your LinkedIn page and realize, hey, you know, this person is quite a, a warmonger, right? He, he, he you know, kind of, you know, insinuates uh, or rather, um, provokes a lot of people, a lot of comments, you know, tries to get people agitated, you know, in response to anything. So, so yeah, so, so be authentic, you know, be specific and uh, be kind. I think these are really the, the three basic rules that I live by on my LinkedIn profile. I think, again, you know, just thinking about how uh, you want to uh, get ahead of the competition is to perfect your elevator pitch. I think a lot of people think of this as, you know, trying to sell a business idea all the time where, you know, they watch Shark Tank, they, you know, go into a meeting, you know, or it's a, it's a pitch presentation, uh, you're trying to get an account, for instance. Uh, a lot of what the people in the room are looking at is the presenters on the ground and how you portray yourself, right? So it's very important to understand that, you know, how you are selling yourself as a person, as an individual, as an employee of a company, you need to deliver that gusto you need to really, you know, have people feel like you're very engaged with what you're doing. And outside of what you're talking about at work, you know, you really need to show that you have a, a, a human side of you, right? So it's, it's not just in these uh, professional situations, you know, when you're in a cafe, uh, when you're in a Zoom or house party, you know, when you're playing a game and, you know, there are new people on board, a lot of people want to understand who you are, what you stand, stand for. And I think do not stop perfecting your elevator pitch. This is something I've learned uh, over the course of my career. You know, whenever someone asks for an introduction, I, I used to fumble a lot, right? I used to think about what, what I should say, you know, which part of my job I should talk about. And so, so think about it. Just have three critical points about what uh, drives you in your job, you know, what are you responsible for and, and what keeps you going. And I, I think that would win most battles, you know, whether socially or professionally. So right. uh, moving on to the third part, should we have a look at the questions, uh, Geraldine, if there's any? Sure, maybe I'll just quick give a quick uh, summary of what has been covered so far. Because okay, I well, I look at the just, questions. Just sure. joined in, yeah. So what we've actually covered so far was, you know, really how can you actually stand out in this job market, right, with more applicants than positions available. Um, it's really the first, like, you know, leverage some resources. So, uh, moving on to the third part, should we have a look at the... Sorry. <laughs> oh. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, so basically, um, okay, what I was actually sharing was that, you know, what we actually shared so far was that, you know, how can you actually make yourself, you know, easily found on LinkedIn, right? And how can you actually optimize your profile in a way that you can be easily searched for? And what are some ways you can actually stand out? So don't just apply to job portals, right? Just take the extra step and, like, message the hiring manager or recruiter, you know, especially if it's a company that you really, really want to be part of. And Jason also covered many good points. For instance, how can you actually best um, engage your audience on LinkedIn? Uh, so you actually shared some tips around, you know, being authentic, um, you know, being specific, and also, you know, ensuring that you maintain like respect and kindness for other people. And we ended off the section, you know, with emphasizing the importance of having an elevator pitch, you know, so being able to kind of like, um, be able to summarize like you know who you are and you know 
what you can offer in just a few sentences, like three key points. So that was actually what was covered so far. So Jason, maybe we can just look at the Q&A now. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, well, there, there is an interesting question. I think uh, it's like, uh, how, how would the 60 billion government funds actually cushion unemployment rates in Singapore? So I'm, I'm no you know, economist, but uh, I have read the papers enough. And honestly speaking, the three funds that have been released so far and how it's, it's cushioning unemployment rates, it's very obvious, right? Uh, for starters, you know, when it first was released, the first tranche was actually looking at um, um, supplementing the salaries of the employees under your care. So, and then the subsequent 10 months after for self-employed individuals, uh, in initially it was only looking at March as a payout, but now they have extended uh, because of the circuit breaker extension as well. So of course, partially, you know, some of these, um, uh, grants are given out to protect your jobs uh, as a result of subsidizing the cost of your salary to the employer. Uh, a lot of the different aspects of it is really to just uh, pump more money into uh, businesses that can support uh, the rest of the economy during this period over uh, difficult times. So I, I think uh, without talking so much more into how much money, you know, just, just talking about the cash inflow into the economy, I think we need to think about uh, how you know businesses at the current moment are also trying to support uh, the different ways of um, working with these uncertainties, right? So if, if I mean something closer to my heart is looking at how uh, Redmart has been trying to increase uh, their volume with regards to um, uh, deliveries, right? So. You know, if you want to scale out in a number of orders per day and you have to reach more locations and more customers as a result of uh, people having to stay at home, it's, it's, a, it's a huge exercise, you know, trying to get uh, more drivers, uh, more people in the warehouse to support logistics. So this is inadvertently also creating jobs uh, um, during this period. And, and so individual associations such as uh, the Singapore FinTech Association together with MAS are also pushing out grants that will support um, fintechs like ours and ours. So, so I think it's important to look into the different verticals that you're working with, the different sectors, and uh, to, to actually search for all these grants that can help you in uh, various ways. So, so let's not think about you know, trying to support um, everyone uh, from suffering in this period of time, right? Because uh, honestly speaking, the government can only do so much, right? So gyms that are forced to close, let's not even talk about your fitness first or virgins. Uh, the smaller SME ones, those are the worst hit because they are so dependent on um, uh, like maybe 20 to 30 people on a given month to you know, go to them, swimming schools, your grab drivers, uh, so on and so forth. Yeah, I hope that answers your question. Uh, should we move on and then we'll take on more questions later? All right, okay, let's move on to our uh, next section or how you can actually amplify your personal brand. So basically, personal branding is one of the you know, ways that you can really, uh, one of the long-term strategies you can use to kind of like stand out from the competition. A brand is not something you build in a day and there's actually a process behind it. So I'll let Jason kind of like share with you his journey on how he actually branded himself and made it to become a CMO today. So, I mean, I, I want to be really um, humble about my journey. Uh, I started off interestingly as a biomedical student in NUS. Uh, my major was uh, biomedical science uh, from the Faculty of Science in NUS. And after my first year, I, I decided that, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's not my life. I didn't want to be, uh, you know, someone that is cladded in a research code and, you know, being in the lab. And I think during at least my era, you know, it was, it was a huge push for uh, pharma companies to come in and set up shop and uh, research in laboratories. And, you know, we are, the, the, the whole industry was massive, but we were only looking at maybe like the top one to 5% of each cohort. So there wasn't a lot of promise for me. So, so how I, I really arrived at um, where I am today, I, I took on a minor in uh, technopreneurship, uh, which was something pretty interesting that was offered by uh, NUS at the moment of time. And it had a partner program with 
um, I think um, certain universities in the Silicon Valley. So uh, a lot of the focus of the curriculum was about entrepreneurship, marketing, accountancy, you know, more the business side of things. And I found really that interest in that area. So I would say that was when I first uh, decided that actually, you know, marketing seems to be something that was more um, obviously on track with what I wanted to do. And I was doing very well academically for it as well. So, so you no, know, I started off a job and, and the next few jobs uh, and few years that I've been in these jobs was really to distill uh, what I've learned and, and what I needed to learn, right? So, so during this period, uh, you know, building that personal brand, I, I, I felt like, okay, so what do I want to stand for? How do I want to grow myself as a professional in marketing? Uh, I looked at uh, what I had as existing skills. I looked at the gaps that I needed to fill. And of course, I looked at the values to which uh, I had um, to contribute to the companies that I was with at that period of time. Um, so, so then I you know, took this period and a, a few jobs in between that helped uh, fill certain um, functional gaps in terms of like uh, picking up uh, Google SEM or even um, uh, solidifying my knowledge in social media. Uh, this, this was that mid career. I wouldn't say mid career because I, I consider myself still okay as in young. <laughs> uh, so, so it's more really uh, understanding where your gaps are and you know, trying to level up. So it was also during this period as well that I got retrenched, but I think that was another story for another day. And uh, during my retrenchment was also when I, I discovered that you know, I needed to do something on the side you know, to keep myself relevant. And, and you know, I actually picked up copywriting and I was supporting an agency doing it. So the last part, you know, after discovering myself and distilling the skills that I needed um, for my career and how I'm, I'm, I'm looking at my personal brand uh, was to define what I wanted to be, you know, at the end of my career. So I looked towards the last 10 years of my life and I thought about, you know, who, who is it that I wanted to be, you know, during these last 10 years of my life and, and you know, what I needed to do to get there. So, so this was, uh, I would say, almost the turning point where I decided, okay, you know, um, my, my, brand, my brand story has been such, right? I, I dropped off uh, biomedical science. Uh, I have decided that technopreneurship slash entrepreneurship was the way I wanted to go. In a particular role that I took on, you know, I, I actually um, launched a rocket series of companies in Singapore. So I was working with uh, Zalora, Food Panda, uh, the likes of the rocket companies. And, and from there on, you know, I, I really saw that energy and and the amount of um, knowledge that you could amass. And that got me a role in uh, Lazada. So I spent a good three and a half, year, half years really you know, honing my skills there. And I, I rode on the wave of e-commerce. And then you know, I ended my journey last year. And then now with the new wave of Digibank and challenger banks that are coming into Singapore and how MAS is trying to encourage the growth, I have joined a, a startup called Andawas, you know, a startup that I, I really uh, feel very proud to be part of, right? So, so that's my brand story. And it fortunately came very naturally. And I think a lot of what you need to do is really to look at yourself towards the last 10 years of your life. Because a lot of what you go through in terms of interview is, oh, where do you see yourself next in three years or five years? And very simply, you would say, oh, I want to be a regional manager or director. I want to have a team of five reporting to me. But I think, you know, it's too short term. Think about what your last 10 years of your life should look like and think about how to get there. And so, I think just, yeah, handing it over to Geraldine. Yeah, so I think what Jason described, right? The entire process of discovery, distill, and also defining yourself, this is the the process in which you go through in order to, to brand yourself. But many of my peers actually tell me that, you know, getting started is like one of the hardest things that they face. Like, how do you even put yourself out there? Especially for Asian culture, like ours, we are not so used to kind of like, um, you know, talking about like our achievements, you know, speaking up and things like that. However, if, uh, maybe I could share a bit about Michelle Obama's story just to inspire you guys. So Michelle Obama is like now like the world, one of the world's most admired uh, women, right? She's, she's known for a lot of things, you know, being charismatic, fun, kind, good role model, relatable and all that. But it wasn't always this way. So if you look back, you know, at her first 
campaign with Obama in 2008, where she was actually helping him uh, back then. She was like the first, you know, um, to be a black uh, first lady, right? And back then, there were a lot of uh, racist people in the US who were actually, you know, stereotyping her as like the angry black woman kind of thing, because she was just someone who was different from the other first ladies in the past. So what she did was like, of course, she didn't step back and like go and disappear and like hide, right? What she did was actually she took control of her own brand. She took control of her own image, right? And she actually turned things around. So what she did was like, you know, get active on social media to tell the world who she is, who is her, who, what is she like. She actually wrote a book also, Becoming, which is one of the best sellers out there. I think they sold around 10 million copies. And she's even getting her own Netflix show. Like it's going to be out on the 6th May and they just announced it yesterday. So it's like a surprise show. So do remember to catch it as well. And the, the point I want to make here is that if Michelle Obama left her image right to be defined by racist people and didn't step up to take control of it and turn things around, she wouldn't be where she is today. And this story right, doesn't apply only to, you know, great people like Michelle Obama. It also applies to the regular men on the street like you and me. And maybe I'll just share also a bit of my personal experience when it comes to personal branding. When, when I was 22 years old, and I actually started writing and sharing opinions on, uh, you know, my thoughts on local issues, right? Uh, this, was, this was a very male-dominated field. And generally, the people who are in this field as well, writing about current affairs, they're guys, and they were around 10 years older than I was back then. So I actually faced a lot of... Uh, sexism and there were people calling me like bimbo who is this xiao mei mei trying to come on board and discuss current affairs with us so um there were two options back then right one is actually to shut down my like, social media pages and kind of like disappear and flee the scene you know but um i didn't choose that right i chose to like take control of my own brand as well so i showed people that i wasn't dumb uh like i kind of got featured on uh fox when i was 26 and then i was also recognized with an award for being a rising star in my industry and I also did well in my career in finances so I used all that and like you know um, to show people that you know I was different I was not like some Xiao Mei Mei or like Bimbo who is trying to you know participate in a topic that I didn't know anything about so if you know if you, like what Michelle Obama mentioned like if you don't get out there right and define yourself you will be quickly and inaccurately defined by others and that is very true now of course you know there's a lot of ways to brand yourself and the best testimony, right, is not what you say about yourself. It's actually what other people say about you. So back in my time when I was still studying in NTU, uh, some students were like somehow uh, trained to write on their LinkedIn, uh, like, oh, I'm a very hardworking and dedicated final year student at Nanyang Business School. Like, come on, uh, <laughs> I also can say, right, <laughs> correct? So you can talk about how, how great you are, but the most powerful thing that you can do to kind of like show who you are is really get other people to like vouch for you. Because social proof is something that is very powerful, right? Like when we look for new cosmetics or new products, we always read reviews. Why? Because we care about like social proof. So same for people when they're evaluating you, they would, you know, check, uh, reference other people and they'll try to understand who you are. So if you're thinking of collecting like testimonials or, or like LinkedIn recommendations or anything like that, do collect it from three types of people. Your, your peers so that you know people know that you are like a team player uh, and also your boss so that you know your future boss will know that you are someone who is easy to manage and also eager to learn and ultimately you also can get that from your customers especially if you are in a client facing role to show people that you can actually engage customers well now we talk a lot about linkedin but other than linkedin another very important platform is also google especially google first page right and this entire process of like, you know, personal branding and what I've described, it doesn't just apply to the candidates and the regular people. It also applies to bosses, right? So when I was actually interviewing for a role, I was actually trying to learn more about my direct boss, you know? I mean, of course, during the interview itself, he's very nice and everything. And, but I'm also aware that during interview, people will always, you know, say all the nice things that you want to hear and put their best foot forward. So what I did was that, you know, after the interview, when I got an offer, I was thinking about whether to join or not. I, I did some uh, research, so I went to Google him, and uh, I couldn't find much, you know, because he's quite like hidden, right? But what I found was actually his carousel profile, and the reviews were like pretty good. So I was like, you know, buyers were actually saying like nice things about him. So from there, I was like kind of assured that he will be a good person to work for because boss is very important, right? So uh, that ultimately led me to kind of accept the role. So. Um, do do an audit regularly on your, about yourself on Google and just make sure that, you know, uh, there's more positive than, than negative that is out, uh, out there. And 
I guess my last point is actually like, you know, it, personal branding is not just like an online thing, right? It's not just Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. It's also like the human-to-human connection, right? So it has to extend to offline. Like people will not, you know, people ultimately remember you the most when they see you in person. So, um, you know, before the COVID-19 period, uh, what I would do is that, you know, I would actually push myself, right? That I have to attend like a networking session alone once every quarter. So this is a goal that I set for, for myself. And it was quite challenging because I'm not like super extroverted. I'm kind of like an ambivert in a sense. So what I'll do is I actually encourage you to also attend networking sessions. Uh, there's a quite a few ways you can do that. Um, first, you'll be able to, you can actually think about maybe taking a class, right? Let's say you're interested in a certain topic, like, oh, maybe I'm interested in UX, then I take this class that is uh, there and then I get to know people who are also interested in the same topic who may be in similar or adjacent kind of industries. Or you could actually attend an industry talk. Um, you know, maybe they are discussing like the latest tech trends in HR, then you can just go for, for, for that talk and then get to know the people who are attending as well. Or you can just attend something that you are interested in that professionals will attend. So like, for example, um, some of the recent events I went to this year was one on fintech and another one on like environmentalism, which I care passionately about. Now, um, speaking of which, during these events, right, people will meet a lot of people. So it's very hard to remember who is who. So as best practice, it's also good to kind of like send like a follow-up um, email. Uh, so this is some email that I received this year from uh, someone who, who I think has chosen to remain anonymous. But basically, I thought it was very simple and well-crafted. So my point is really just remember to follow up, send something polite so that they remember you after that. And yeah, that's it for what we have to cover in the entire section on personal branding. Now, before we move into the next section, let me just do a quick summary. What we have covered so far was like, you know, um, the process of defining your personal brand, um, why you need to step up, right, and take control of your image, like how Michelle Obama did, um, how you can actually, you know, who you should actually collect reviews from because social proof is really important. And of course, you know, being consistent, right, extending this to offline, you know, challenging yourself to just, you know, attend events alone and just get to know new people. So this is what we have covered previously. Before we go to our next section, right, on staying relevant and upgrading yourself, maybe let's just take some questions uh, from the floor. Why, why do you pick a question this time, this time, Jordan? Mm. Okay. So there is this question on um, how do you guys find mentors? So Jackson, are you personally a mentor to anyone like who is interested to kind of be in marketing and to do well in marketing? Uh, yes, actually, even unofficially, when I was with my previous role, I was a mentor to many of the junior staff. Um, I say that unofficially because uh, we didn't have a proper structure, but I, I found myself um, helping, you know, some of the, you know, the, the, the younger uh, professionals uh, think about their next step and actually a lot of people a lot of them had offers on hand or they they were thinking about role changes they were thinking about you know switching uh, careers and I had the time to uh, share with them my story and to give them tips to why they should or should not but a lot of all the um, decisions have to be made on um, their end of course finally uh, just providing a view of uh, the pros and cons to the different uh, approaches that they can take. Uh, back to your question, um, I unfortunately did not have a mentor, uh, but I saw all my team leads, uh, all my bosses as uh, mentors, right, unofficially. Uh, I think a lot of the reviews that we do, obviously, uh, for performance-based type of uh, reviews and uh, even um, talking about, like, soft side, like your attitude, you know, what they're looking forward to, you know, are you happy with your role? Uh, I get a lot of insights from uh, my direct bosses. So, so you can form that mentor relationship with your direct boss. Uh, but you know what, I, I think it's more important for you to think about someone that is outside of uh, your area or your sphere of influence, because uh, people outside those areas would give you, I think, a different perspective of how they see you in your uh, zone. And I think your boss has a very um, straightforward view of uh, you trying to attain all the KPIs and OKRs that you're given. And I think a lot of uh, what you can glean from uh, mentors outside of uh, your sector is uh, 
really the knowledge that they are in, also the network and, and the department that they are uh, ruling in. So, so I, interestingly, I will share, there's a section later with uh, regards to mentorship. Very quickly, uh, there's an organization called Voices of Asia. Uh, it's locally set up. And I think there are already around a thousand mentors that are on board this program uh, across various sectors, uh, across uh, different seniorities. Uh, you can just sign up and, um, uh, and what they will do is they will match you up with uh, a mentor uh, that you're comfortable with. And I think it's very low touch. Uh, it's maybe once a week or once a month, depending on you know, how much you need their assistance. So yeah, so, so this is how I would say it's, it's one of the ways that you could look for a mentor. So for myself, right, when I was looking for a mentor, I actually went with a more direct approach. So uh, my mentor is currently uh, this guy who runs his own business and he's actually outside of my industry. Uh, and he doesn't want to be named, so I cannot name him here. <laughs> so basically, um, I, I chose him because I felt that he could teach me and guide me in some areas that I was not super, super good at. Like, for example, like uh, areas that I could grow more in, like leadership and also uh, communication skills. So these were the things that I wanted to learn. And I actually went to him and said, like, you know, I, I'm here this, this place in my career so far. And there seems to be some gaps. So these are the gaps. Like, I think that, you know, you are someone that I can really learn from and, you know, I would really love for you to be my mentor. So that's how this entire thing started. And I kind of like meet him before COVID, <laughs> meet him like once, uh, two, twice a month, once every two weeks. Yeah, correct. So just to kind of like, you know, uh, and there's every meeting, there's a like agenda that we have to cover. So that has been very useful so far in helping me to cover up the gaps that I have, especially from a soft skills um, perspective. Yeah. So that was my, my journey on, on mentorship. No, I think that's a, a extremely uh, good way of looking at it because your mentor should complement your gaps of knowledge and, and you have perfectly um, pointed uh, uh, at something that's really important, right? So so really just, just look for someone that can complement the areas where you find there's gaps in, right? Whether it's leadership, team management, you know, even coding, right? Things that you're interested and passionate about. Uh, so, so just moving on quickly to the next um segment, uh, I think we, we want to share, you know, how to stay relevant, you know, how to think about uh, during this period, you know, there's, the lines are blurred now, you know, I realized that a lot of um, people have started talking about work on weekends, you know, it extends beyond 6pm and, and sometimes the, the, the day starts earlier than usual. Uh, it's, uh, you know, I think Bloomberg has written about it, it's something that we should be mindful about, to think about, you know, work-life balance, you know, amidst this uh, graying, you know, when home and office is now together. Uh, but really the next part is uh, to think about how to, you know, stay relevant during this period and how to upgrade yourself, right? So I guess when it comes to that, right, you know, the topic of staying relevant and also upgrading yourself, um, my perspective is just like, you know, don't just take the most like in course and the most like trendy course, right? Like don't like, oh, coding sounds very interesting. I'm going to learn it. Or like data science sounds very cool. And my mom says it's very important. So I'm going to learn it, that kind of things. Um, so don't just follow the crowd, right? Uh, the way to approach learning and what you want to learn is that, you know, you need to start at one point, right? Where you are now. And then you think about like where you want to be in the next two years, three years, five years and all that. And then from there, you walk backwards. Like, okay, here's where I want to be, right? I want to be in this place in five years time but these are my gaps maybe i don't have really good public speaking skills maybe i i need to pick up on like you know um my mandarin to improve it further so these are the gaps that i face and then you can uh, work uh, work towards that uh, and think like okay so since like i need to learn business mandarin where can i learn it from so that is the way you go about planning your learning journey it's not like following like the most cool thing and the most um um trendy thing right now but really picking courses that are something that you are interested in and more importantly, aligned to your career objectives and career goals also. Now, moving on to, to the next point, uh, of course, there are a lot, a lot of options that are available out there in the market. However, um, my recommendation would be, uh, you know, don't just like take any course with very good marketing and advertisement, right? Um, there's a few ways to kind of like verify. Uh, first of all, you can actually ask people in the industry or past students if they would actually want to kind of like endorse the, would they actually want to endorse this course? And if you, if you don't know anyone, you can actually just reach out on LinkedIn again. So if you see here, right, this is just an email that I received, in mail that I received quite recently about like, you know, um, someone who actually is thinking about taking the same course as I, I, I took previously. So 
what uh, I'll do is actually reply him uh, this week to kind of like give him my review, right? And um, besides that, you can also take like um, trial, trial lessons or course preview. And why is this important? It's because sometimes the teacher may not be suitable for you, even though the school is like good. Um, for example, like I can't really pay attention well in uh, classes whereby the teacher is like more low energy. So that's why I prefer a teacher with uh, more high energy and who can actually, who I can actually uh, follow up easily on. And lastly, I think brand name of the school is quite important because I guess when people look at brand name, they will associate that with like the credibility also. So these are just some things that I will look for in, you know, before even putting my money for the course. Well, maybe Jason, you have other points to, to add as well? No, I, I think um, really having an endorsement on the course is very important, right? So, so speaking with people that have already taken the course is... Uh, it's, it's as best as, as as good as it gets, right? So, so but I think for me, is is you need to have an end in mind on what these courses can help you do, right? So, so is it immediately going to be helpful for your current role? Is it going to be something that will help you grow in, in, in what's your next role? Uh, you need to ask yourself uh, these questions. But I, I think there are three key points that um, you need to understand before you undertake whatever courses uh, there are out there, right? Uh, for me, the first one is really to skip the basics. If there are courses that talk about like, you know, investing 101s or like uh, Google Analytics 101 or beginner's guide to um, Google search engine optimization, I would say skip those. And really, I think a lot of times you can do very simple, um, you know, basic, spend some time on researching all this information and, and you know, do a proper uh, understanding, you know, via you know youtube tutorials even uh go advance especially if you want to pay for something and especially if it's a brand name that you you think can make a difference on your profile uh i think uh the cost relevance is of course something that is very important to you right so taking a, a course in digital disruption uh when you are in a business that is not digital i think it's um, it's definitely important. You're thinking about how to move, you know, your business from a traditional setup to one that's digital. Uh, the next part is really to be invested in uh, the course that you're taking right now. Uh, a lot of the free courses, uh, they are, they have like time spans that are up to you, right? Uh, you can take up to six months or a year to finish these courses. And I think these are the ones that are the least productive, unless you're someone that's extremely disciplined. Uh, give yourself a time frame to which you want to complete a course or really follow one that has a designated um, a period uh, for completion. And I think the best way to really go towards doing a course is also to seek support from uh, your boss, right? Uh, a lot of times, all these courses that you're taking is supposed to enhance your productivity or certain knowledge gaps that you have. Uh, and, and you know what I would do? I would actually just think about getting a friend to sign up with me. So, you know, when it comes to tutorials or any like group participations, it's great to have someone that, you know, is familiar and can help you uh, pull some of the, uh, to, 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 to carry some of the weight, you know, with regards to assignments. And the last part, which uh, we touched on a little bit um, on is really getting a mentor. Um, it's, it's really not about finding the most, um, experienced person, uh, the most uh, senior person, you know, whether it's a C level or, you know, a, a director level, it's really getting someone that can complement the gaps that you are, you are having, you know, in your role or in the future roles that you are trying to um, acquire as uh, you move from uh, the job to another. Uh, I think it's really easiest, you know, to find someone at work that you look up to that can help you uh, give you an overview of you know what the business is and, and you know, actually help you network with uh, people that um, you, you don't even think about talking to right you know someone for instance i think just for myself you know being in marketing you know you don't talk to people in finance you know that much you don't talk to people in product and and actually finding a mentor in these areas you know i uh, i, I had a i wouldn't say a mentor but someone whom i was working closely with and and i i see that person as a mentor and 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 through the relationship we had, I, I really, you know, got a lot of uh, information with regards to, you know, how to launch product, you know, understanding the nuances, project management, and so on and so forth. And of course, lastly, 
uh, Voices of Asia, again, it's, it's, uh, it's something that's out there. I think it's very simple a platform to sign up for. I'm, I'm, I'm doing a plug here because I really believe in this platform and I think that it will help a lot of people uh, get uh, you know, some, some form of um, traction in what they're doing today. So I see the challenges to the, the, the younger uh, job seekers and, and the ones that are currently employed right now. A lot of them are a little fleeting in the way that they are looking towards uh, employment. So, so really, uh, I think it's, it's not about being grounded. It's about really learning you know, what you need to uh, do for your future and what your passion should take you to next. So I think the last part of our presentation is talking about finances. Uh, interestingly, uh, the last part is really talking about how we should uh, protect our cash flow. And I think Geraldine did a really, really good survey, uh, which she's going to share uh, in a moment. Uh, we are a little, you know, interestingly running on time. I thought we had a good rehearsal with regards to this, but. Uh, I think we, we can touch on the next slides uh, in a moment, but I think a lot of what we fail to do, you know, in our endless endeavor to be the best person at work and to uh, be the breadwinner to the family is to think about how to plan for uh, our finances. And, and Jody will share with you, you know, some of the tips. Okay, so so what I've done uh, recently, right? Because I've saw the survey, you know, on like you know uh, the results from the Maybank analyst that you know there could be one hundred fifty thousand entrenchments during this season. So I kind of like tried to understand from people what would be you know, the time frame that you, you may take to kind of like look for a new job. And it does seem that people actually think that you know, they will take you know, maybe more than 12 months to kind of like look for a new role um, during this period of time. Therefore, when it comes to protecting cash flow, I feel that it would be a good idea to at least have uh, 12 months of emergency funds that are being set aside so that you can access it, access it easily um, especially in times of um, need and crisis. And how can you actually go about um, building your savings? So maybe I, what I will do is that, you know, kind of like walk you guys through how I also manage my own cash flow, right? Before and after COVID. So if you go to the next slide, um, you will see that, okay, so this is how I actually manage my monthly cash flow, right? So this this is the entire journey of how my, my, my uh, salary goes each month. So what I do is basically... Um, before my salary even touched my saving account, actually 25% is being deducted. Around 20% actually goes into CPF and another 5% goes into buying my own company stocks. And then after that, the 75% then enters my savings account. And what I do is actually have a different account from my uh, uh, expenses account and saving account. So what I do is actually kind of pay myself like allowance, right? And I want to emphasize that this is actually uh, one of the methods which you can use to kind of save money quickly. Because um, when, you're, when you're actually giving, transferring money to your own expenses account, what you're doing is essentially giving yourself allowance, right? Like, okay, maybe I set aside 1000 a month and then I give myself that allowance to spend. So you wouldn't actually touch whatever is in your savings. And essentially, you are prioritizing your savings over your spendings. And another advantage of this approach is you don't have to go and break down your expenses because you kind of know like, okay, every month I spend around this amount and this is the only amount I will spend. The rest, I will save it. Now, um, another thing is that, you know, besides uh, having your own savings, don't forget to also kind of invest your, your money. So this is what I do. I actually kind of like invest my, my uh, part of my money every month. And because when you put it in the bank, right, technically you lose money so because of inflation and everything. So um, I guess, Jason, you have been also pretty involved with uh, investing as well. Maybe you could share a bit about your own experiences. Well, I, I wouldn't say I've been pretty involved in investing. In fact, I would say I would have had one of the most uh, rockiest invest, investment path, right? I, I, I get very distracted easily, you know, at a certain point of time I was doing shares, you know, I was doing funds, uh, but, you know, I never stuck to a plan. Uh, but I think a lot of, um, at least where we see the problem for um, Singaporeans is that a lot of us, you know, we have savings in our banks. We have like high uh, amounts of uh, OA in our CPF, you know, but we, we don't do anything about it, right? So 37% of our salary actually goes to CPF. 
And I think with what you have said earlier, 23% is, is really the bare minimum and everyone should be able to put that amount in their um, savings account and not touch it. But the rest, you know, you really need to consider how, you know, the expenses that you take on a day-to-day basis will uh, affect uh, this uh, eventual 23%. And I think another part of um, uh, what I've uh, understood from, you know, most of my peers that uh, there's this fixation that uh, this 2.5% in OA is the one that will take you to retirement. Uh, I think while the government guarantees this 2.5% in OA, you know, it's, um, it's an amazing rate that, you know, I don't think any of the governments in the world would actually uh, promise on the pension fund. Uh, this is, you know, a, a huge part of our wealth that we should really consider growing. And I think, you know, a lot of where our um, population is not doing enough is thinking about how to maximize the OA uh, and I think a lot of where at least Andawas is trying to solve in terms of uh, trying to, you know, boost your 2.5% is in all the products that we have on our platform. So I think the last part also looking at CPF life, you know, and thinking that it's actually uh, enough, you know, by the time you reach the age of uh, 62 and it's time for retirement, you are actually looking at, you know, on an estimated uh, 1.5K maximum. Uh, on a monthly basis that you can get from CPF Life. Uh, assuming you have a roof over your head, I, I think that's, that I would say is a decent amount of money, right? So, but if you don't have a roof over your head and you have, um, you know, expenses that are climbing on you as you reach that age, you know, whether is it um, medical or uh, other assets that you're paying for, I mean, liabilities like cars, for instance, uh, you really need to think about uh, whether what is that final sum at retirement? Think of that age and add any and add at least another twenty to thirty years on it, and, and that's actually, um, honestly speaking, the life expectancy of most um, Singaporeans right now. So, are you really sufficiently planned uh, for retirement? I think that's for me. It's a, a, an important takeaway because I have started late, but I think I'm really, really coming back on track. And I think uh, a lot of uh, where Endowas is coming on board is uh, to, to solve that problem with CPF and giving exclusive access um, to funds. I think for instance, last week we launched uh, a Vanguard Manager Passive Index Fund. Uh, you know, it's, it's definitely better in terms of uh, performance and risk and it's at the lowest cost. You know, we don't, we don't charge any sales charges. And uh, we also recently you know, gave back uh, 100% in terms of trailer fees back to our clients. So the, the last part really is, if I were work, walk with my CPF, if I could quote uh, Raymond, you know, with his work salary man, um, IG, which is so popular right now, and everyone is just looking at the financial tips. I mean, he's, he's done a really great job of uh, making bite-sized information, uh, financial tips, right? So if I had started to invest, you know, uh, granted that I have a decent starting salary of $3,000 and a modest uh, 10% increment on a yearly basis. Actually, you know, if I had invested my money since then, uh, I, I would have got, I would have gotten at least 2.5 million at the age of 55 years old. If I had done nothing, you know, I could have gotten 900,000. But then again, I, I was going back to what I was talking about. Split that by at least 20 to 30 years of your life expectancy and ask yourself whether that's enough to take you through a comfortable retirement. So yeah, I think that's um, actually my parting message with regards to uh, financial um, planning. So I think, uh, well, we are just nice on time. We have done an hour. Uh, I think, uh, Geraldine, would you like to just summarize you know, what we have done so far you know, over the five points? Sure. So let's do a recap of whatever we have covered so far. And then after that, we will share, be sharing with you like uh, what are the upcoming events you can attend before we move into the Q&A section. So what we've talked about so far is that we started this session, right? Talking about like how COVID-19 has actually impacted our lives. So we shared some statistics around, you know, the retrenchment numbers, economic growth numbers and all that. And then we focused on the solution after that. Like, 
say you are looking for a job during this period of time, how can you actually get ahead of the competition, especially in this labor market whereby there could be possibly more, uh, more roles that are being, um, you know, more people looking for jobs than roles that are being open. And subsequently, how can you build a more longer term strategy of like kind of amplifying your personal brand and continuing to upgrade yourself? And we ended off the session today by talking about like, you know, something a little bit more immediate, which is that during this period of time, how can you actually protect and manage your cash flow better? So maybe Jason, you can also share a little bit more about like, you know, if people are interested to learn more, what other kind of events, you know, by Endowers could they kind of attend to build their knowledge, especially in other areas like, you know, investing and all that. Just in your mute. <laughs> Sorry. So at the very start of the, the uh, webinar, we shared that, you know, this was going to be one that um, it's not going to be as hard sell. We're not going to share so much about Endow as a uh, uh, digital financial advisor. Uh, but we, we do have a lot of um, webinars planned um, for the next few weeks, all the way up to the end of June. And, and all these are centered around trying to help you be more financially competent, right? So a lot of where we see uh, the general profile of Singaporeans is they, they, are, they are already financially um, literate, right? So, so we really need to go to the next level to help them be more competent about um, the money that they're going to put, you know, in various, you know, investment engines, whether it's it, um, in ETFs or, you know, in passive index funds or, you know, in shares that they think that, you know, will just jump like five to 10 times, uh, of course, during this period. So the next few weeks, I think, just let me share overview. Uh, next week, we are going to have um, Dollars and Cents, uh, one of the top uh, financial um, editorials in Singapore. I'm going to have Tim, uh, Tim Ho, a, a good friend of ours, uh, co-founding and managing director. He's going to uh, be um, hosting um, a session with uh, Greg, who is our CEO. And we're just going to talk through how, you know, these black swan events you know, will change the way you look at uh, the investment landscape. I think Sam has said uh, many, many times before, and he has been, been through uh, you know, the, the worst recessions. And I think a lot of how people are dealing with their money now, it's really very emotional. Uh, this is gonna be really a very uh, interesting uh, webinar for you to think about, you know, taking a step back and looking at how these events uh, should shape your investment decisions. Um, the next one, uh, I would say this is for everyone. Uh, we are going to have uh, a showdown of, of, of sorts. Uh, we are going to have the rest of the other uh, robo-advisors. Uh, Sidley is hosting an event and, uh, you know, this is going to be, uh, you know, and no host, but, you know, ask whatever questions you want. And, and you know, each of these um, robo-advisors will be fronted by uh, their CEO. We have Sam, uh, our chairman, you know, he's, he's had a, a very uh, good career with Morgan Stanley, you know, being in, finance for over 25 years, being the CEO of Asia Pacific for 17 years. Uh, you know, we, we, we want you to go to this event and really listen to what each of these uh, robo-advisors can do for you. And uh, this is going to happen next week uh, on the 6th of May. And I think something further ahead is, uh, you know, what I've been talking about, you know, as I, I, as I look to it, um, the next 20 years of my life, my working life and how I can really actively make a difference in how much I have when I retire. Um, financial independence, uh, thinking about retiring early in Singapore. Uh, this, is, this, is a, a, this is a movement started by uh, this gentleman who unfortunately cannot be named because he's part of a, a financial institution that, that is, um, well, it's, it's kind of, it's a little bit of a conflict of interest, but. Uh, I would say, you know, he has uh, a really huge following and uh, like Mr. Lu, who, who had uh, 1M65, you know, reaching, you know, 1 million and 65, but he actually reached 1 million at 45 in his CPF. Uh, I would say, you know, this is definitely a session to look out for. And I think finally ending um, the series of uh, slides with regards to the next few webinars is uh, our Q&A. Uh, Geraldine, should I just go off starting? I'll just pick one question first, maybe? Okay, sure. Let's start there. Okay, let me see. Da, 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 da. Okay, so there is a question with... Ah, 
how to improve your own communication skills at work or during networking. So I think, uh, I mean, I'd like to take this question because uh, it's, it's a communications question. And, and you know what, this is something that we do on a daily basis, right? WhatsApp. Uh, Facebook Messenger, emails, and, and Slack, everything that you use, you communicate, right? So the main thing I would say, you know, like how do you improve your own communication skills is really to listen. And, and a lot of, um, you know, I first started off as um, head of partnerships for um, Lazada. And a lot of how I, I managed to, to woo partners to come on board is really understanding where their challenges are with regards to their business, uh, how they want to leverage on um, whether is it our database or you know certain uh, marketing you know channels that we have you know it's it's understanding what problems you are trying to solve for the other person and everyone has a challenge or a problem that you can help solve uh, so think about it as you know trying to understand the person from a point of view of solving their questions listen to what they have to say and really think about uh, how you can be that person to solve these various problems. And the next part is really to, you know, be constructive with uh, how you respond to, uh, you know, these situations. You know, whether is it in a meeting or in a, in a presentation or, you know, whether is it in a negotiation. It's, it's trying to be really um, positive about your responses. And, and I think a lot of, you know, where in some of the companies that I've been with, they, they, they haven't been entirely like, um, it's, it's a very straightforward uh, way of uh, dealing with people. You know, you just, you just tell them straight to the faces, you know, this is what I want, this is what you can do for me and get it done, right? So, so you need to be that person to, to soften that, that effect, right? Not just for the person you're dealing with, but even for everyone that you're working with under your team. So I think, Again, it really just boils down to that first part, which is really to listen, to listen intently on what this person needs to be solved as a problem and understand whether you are the right person to solve that problem. Otherwise, uh, you know, if, if you're not a person to solve the problem, you are going to add more problems to his plate, his or her plate. So really just listening is, is the best way to um, really um, see through your entire communications uh, process. So Geraldine, do you have something else you want to pick for? All right. So there's this really interesting question by Joelle. Joelle, J-O-E-L-L-E. -L -L -E. So it's very nice, very nice name actually. So she, she did ask like, if I self-learn a skill, uh, Adobe and video editing per se, would it be reasonable for me to like write it out? When would it be reasonable for me to write it in my resume? So first of all, you should totally put it in your resume if you've learned it by yourself because I think that it really shows people that you are very proactive and you actually take time, you know, outside your work to learn a new skill. So kudos to you for that. As for when, um, okay. So basically, I, I think I understand where you are coming from. Uh, what you are saying is that maybe you kind of like feel that you haven't achieved a certain level, so it should not be in your resume yet. But what you can do is put it like, you know, just write the skill and then bracket like maybe uh, basic or intermediate or advanced kind of thing just to set people's expectations right but definitely you should always like you know put that in your resume or so because like, I think it really shows employers that you are very proactive and someone who is very very eager to learn about the you know to learn beyond like what you are doing and to just grow yourself yeah and, and I, I I think that's exactly where I was thinking of, about with regards to this question as well the main thing is to be very honest about where you are with uh, these skill sets. So if you are conversant with it, just put your conversant. If you are an expert, just do so. So when you reach at least the doors of the interview, you, you can help them, you know, you're building a story to where you want to be with the company as well. And sometimes it's, it's great to hear that, oh, actually, you know, you're conversant, but you're trying to be, you know, something more than what you are. So, so then they would feel like, you know, this is someone that you are, you could nurture, you know, unless of course that person needs that expert um, uh, level at the, at the current moment. So any other questions? Let me see.
So there is actually a lot of questions that are just combing downwards. Okay, so I, I think there's one by uh, Jeff Lim. He's asking, are online courses generally accepted by companies? Uh, you know what? It's interesting because a lot of even MBAs and EMBAs are going online. And I think really because of the current situation with COVID and a lot of um, how you know, the, the world of academia is forced into um, conducting courses online, that people will start taking a step back and thinking that you know, actually online courses could be uh, very crucial in you know, that, that only way where you could advance in your career. You know? So the most important thing is to think about what level of um, certification you need for these courses and whether it's the professional certifications that you require, right? So if you're talking about MBA and EMBA courses, and, and you know, these are the ones that are from generally business schools and um, better universities out there, just ensure that these programs are accredited, right? So regardless of whether it's online or offline or has a mix of curriculum, as long as these are accredited by um, other um, academic bodies, uh, I think you should be okay to go forth with it and listing it in your resume and getting credit with regards to uh, the curriculum that they offer. But if it comes down to things that are broader, like you know, digital disruptions, how to do, how, how do you face innovation with partnerships, you know, things that are very generic and, and may seem very skill-based. These are the ones that uh, you need to under understand whether it fits uh, your profile for that specific job. So I would list those if uh, you're going to become like a partnerships lead in a technology company, for instance. And, and they would be highly credible because uh, you would definitely share some uh, tenets to why these courses um, have uh, given you in terms of the curriculum, the skill sets that you need to thrive in that particular role. I hope that answered your question. Geraldine, do you have something? Maybe we will take a last one before we conclude. Okay, actually there is this really interesting question that I saw, which is, um, you know, when you are hiring, what are the traits you look for in an interviewee? Any advice? So, okay, maybe I will give my take first and probably Jason, you should also weigh in since you have been in a position where you have interviewed people a couple of times. For myself, I've only been in a position where I've been interviewed and one of the advice, okay, one of the mistakes that I made previously, right, was like when I first went for interview, I just cared about like showing how technically competent I was. But after that, I realized that, you know, people also hire based on things like um, likability, right? And um, friendliness, because you don't just want someone to execute a task or achieve a certain job. You also want someone that you enjoy working with. So this particular interviewer at a startup, he didn't accept me for the job, but he gave me a very, very solid feedback, which is that, you know, I came across as too strong, right? Like too serious, like, oh, I'm going to help you to do this and everything. But I should kind of like be more, like smile more, be more cheerful and like show that I can actually get along with others well. So that's what I did. And that actually worked out for me. Like every interview, like I try to smile <laughs> and like, you know, be friendly and everything. Not just talk about like oh, my achievement. Here's what I go contribute to your team and everything. So this is a, a very good experience or uh, lesson that I had learned um, very early on in my career that has helped me. But Jason, you are someone who has been in the hiring manager position. It would be good if you can share also like you know, what do you look for when you hire and uh, maybe from your, your own lens? Yeah. I, I personally think that culture fit is uh, on top of my list for um, people that are interviewed. I, I think a lot of times uh, we look at the, the skill sets, right? Obviously, there's a JD that guides you to identifying the person that uh, walks through the door and gets the interview. But at the end of the day, right, you can easily get five people with the same uh, skill sets that you need, right? And they can come in with those skill sets and more. But, you know, understanding the, the soft side of this person or whether he's collaborative, you know, whether he takes initiative, is proactive, you know, um, you know can work under pressure, things like that, uh, can work in a, a, a matrix environment. Um, the culture fit side is really something that cannot be um, or shouldn't be under, undermined because... A lot of times uh, I've seen how people from 
uh, top companies, you know, coming in to, uh, you know, work for you know, various industries, you know, they, they, are, they come in very with full of promise, but, you know, they realize that in a month that they, they can't get along with their colleagues or, you know, they, they don't like the communication style. And, you know, then, then it's a waste of time for both uh, the candidates and uh, the, the recruiter and the company as well. So really importantly, you know, if you are an interviewer, it's really to size the culture fit for that person with the company. And if you are the employee, I think this is the number one thing that you should also check, uh, which is like, you know, how's, how's your working environment like? What's your leadership style? Like, you know, how, how, how do colleagues interact with one another? And of course, these are some of the very superficial questions. I'm sure you can come up with more, but um, honestly speaking, culture fit is, for me, a, a make or break uh, with regards to, um, you know, acing an interview. So, yeah, um, I think, okay, so what we would do actually after this session is to send uh, replies uh, to all the questions that have come in. Uh, we will be getting in touch with uh, everyone that has uh, registered for the event. And uh, thanks, Geraldine, uh, for your time this evening and sharing your you know, personal tips and you know, how to get ahead. I, I think it was very insightful, you know, looking at how proactive you are reaching out on LinkedIn, getting the dream job you want. And I really, I really felt like I should have done that on the early part of my career, but I think it was a, a whole different generation and the way LinkedIn is right now is so much different uh, as compared to five years ago. So uh, really kudos to you on, on making those moves. Um, yeah, it's been a very nice session, you know, together with uh, Geraldine as she shared uh, her, her, her own journey with um, her current company and of course her, her blog which you guys should really, you know, look at, you know, this, this article again, you know, how to jump start, how to get a head start on your salaries between 20 to 30. That's, that's really a good one. So any parting words, Sheridan? Uh, I'm so sorry we all couldn't address like every single question today, but as Jason mentioned, we put kind of like send the replies. If you have any questions for me after, you know, maybe reading my entries or like attending this session or watching my YouTube video, feel free to kind of like, drop me a note on Gmail or Instagram so that I can kind of reply to you and address it as well. Yeah. And thank you, Jason, also for being such a great uh, host today. I think that, you know, there's a lot that people can learn from you, especially becoming a CMO at such a young age and uh, also for sharing your entire journey with, with us. All right. Thanks so much, everyone. We'll see you for the next webinar next week. Goodbye. Goodbye.